it's so like stereotypical to be car journalists and talking about <laughs> rather have an rx7 or a mitsubishi starion actually that, that that one i think i i think i would partake in that one <laughs> i would do I, I all in I on starion so, yeah I, yeah i think i <laughs> i don't i don't want a rotary uh, i now whoa, 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 whoa. you don't want a rotary you are no. ill yeah <laughs> revoke revoke all of your badges See? meeting that's why I'm the like off-road four by four guy. I don't want a rotary. God, talk about imagine. worst engines for a four by four yes. rotary. That's it. <laughs> we have it. We have the answer. That's why I, I'm allergic. The crawl to ratio. The crawl ratio would have to be like three hundred to one. <laughs> you get Nine thousand RPM to get any torque, and then oh to my get God. The real speed, you have to have. Oh man. Oh, that that's cool. horrible. That now that that's um. That's filed under worst project ideas ever. <laughs> exactly. Welcome to the Author Road Again podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Ross. I'm David. And and we're done now. Like we can do whatever we want. It's <laughs> Hell yeah, good. the intro was a success. Yeah, we we did it uh show about anything and everything off-road i feel like i've seen like other like other podcasts and i've been like wow i i thought we were pretty specific but then i i look at their titles and i'm like oh they got more specific than we did so like part of me is like i want to talk to them but also like is their audience smaller than us because they went even smaller in, in a niche 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 oh, it's never it. ending there's look. podcasts out there where people listen there's like five listeners yeah so we got more than five. I know that. We have more than five. <laughs> it's on the rise, actually. So, David, you, you picked a good time to come on. We're, we're, we're climbing. <laughs> Hell yeah. I'm, I'm ready to help you guys build. Catching Woo! the wave. Oh, it, is, it has been an interesting run lately. And we've been off for two weeks from recording. Look, you, can, look, you, can't, you can't be off for two weeks if you're trying to rise. Well, no, no. Like, the shows have posted, but, like, Ross and I yeah. haven't seen each other in two we weeks. We doubled so. down and, and good, good, got good. a bunch of shows uh, recorded in advance. Yeah, we learn yeah. from everybody that's come before us. <laughs> yeah, we, there were like th three weeks of like, I was out a week, then we were in town, and then he was up for like 10 days. So it was like the week we were both in town, I think we recorded four shows. Oh God, it was crazy. It was okay. it was a lot. So uh, David joins us from Jalopnik still? Yes. <laughs> You're like the last guy still there? Jason Torchinsky. That's and, right, Torch still there. Yeah, so that, of course. Raph's Forever. Still Raphael's yeah. still there. Yeah, we got a couple of OGs left, but it's, yeah. It's not what well, it's a good deal. Uh, and we're not related, we think. Yeah, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Somewhere. I'm in Kansas City, so we're you're like Ohio-based, right? I used to live in uh, Leavenworth. See, that's why I don't know. It's a maybe. Uh oh. Now, I will say that I was born in Germany, and I grew up there when I, when I was a young kid. But I moved to Leavenworth when I was 12, uh, not because of the prison. And that was in the army because of the military yeah <laughs> uh yeah uh, so yeah i actually love that part of the country so you just got some points in my book <laughs> it's the i commented on a guy's post the other day on instagram or i like quote tweeted his uh i said instagram twitter post uh and it was like Jap japan at night and like i was just like it japan at night is like haunting and comforting at the same time like the the pictures he put up and then he he responded to me he was like hey i was in kansas city once and i was like what how are like are you you're in japan but yet, yet i have a friend who lives in japan now who was in kansas city for a long time Kansas so city I, deserves more love than it gets i will say it's a great uh point. it it is I, I heard a stat the other day there's expected to be five hundred thousand people to move here in the next two to five years what's the current population uh we're only like two point three i think for the metro area that's a huge huge swell that's right your traffic will be noticeably different well we we have a good layout for traffic already so as long as like they continue to adjust as people get here like it makes sense when i moved to florida i was furious because there was nowhere like you couldn't like hop off and get a different highway or something like around here like the whole city's in a circle of interstate like it, there's always another option kind of thing Florida, you're doomed. Yeah, we just did the Florida, the Florida ordeal. Yeah. <laughs> Our, um, uh, <laughs> I'll tell the story later. <laughs> yes, you will. So I, I that's clearly, a fantastic uh, background. 
Okay. <laughs> That's about all it is at this point. It's a prop. Yeah, yeah, but like it's one of the greatest props ever. So um, I want to jump through new stuff real fast. Uh, because real fast. I want I want to get to that as soon as possible. So uh, since we've recorded, uh, uh, GMC Hummer SUV was released image wise. I think it looks better than the truck. Um, it's more proportionally satisfying. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, I, uh, the question is, is anybody going to buy it at that? It's just such a random. I don't know. It's the the the, cost, the price is so high. I don't know. It is Hummer kind of played out as a brand. Is that is it ever going to be what it was? I don't, I don't think so. I, right. I think, wow. I, I think it'll be hard for it to like be what it was, but they're like trying to capture the the nuttiness of Hummer by going green. I it does look good. Yeah. It, it looks better. I think it looks better than truck by a lot. I agree. I'm, I'm the not problem sold on it in general. No. But. The the problem is that they're going after a green market with a vehicle that if it was I don't know 25% smaller and 25% lighter would satisfy those green needs substantially better yeah so, i mean I, mean, I agree i one of the most the silliest things uh, is we always talk about um maximizing range you know evs cost too much but we want a lot of range say with gasoline vehicles it's like get get mpgs as high as possible so there are two sides of that coin there's the to make that happen you can make your powertrain more efficient which is what everybody seemed to spend a lot of time doing, or you can reduce the energy needed to move your vehicle, mm -hmm. right? Make it smaller, lighter. Um, and so that's kind of like why I like the, um, what was that three wheeler that? Um, the Arkimoto? No, it was like, it was supposed to come out. Oh, Ap 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 Aptera? Aptera? Oh, Aptera? There's the other one. <laughs> There's another one that was supposed to come out. Anyway. Is it electric? No, it wasn't. No, oh, it okay. wasn't. It was little. The point is, like a small car makes a ton yeah, of sense. Yeah, that was fun. Especially when we're, when we're talking EVs, when you've got a large vehicle, that with, with an ICE, if you have a big vehicle, just put a big engine and a big gas tank, it's fine. But no. with an EV, you got to make a huge battery, which is your cost. That is your single most expensive thing. So it's just like if you want a good range with a huge car, it's going to cost a crap ton, and it's yep. it's, a it little, it's a little silly. Everything's so big. I'm really, I, 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 I'm borderline fanboying now at this point because as the number of times I've mentioned them is like, I like the Rivian R1S. Dude, you're all in on fanboying with Rivian, which I, is fine. Rivian looks like they're going to be making an amazing product. Well, and it, it, it seems like the best blend of size, range, and it sounds horrible to say price because the price yeah. for Rivian is only... 75 where the hummers jumped to the 90s like quick like <laughs> with this, i like, mean one it, or two options like it's the next iteration of excess for the sake of excess which is the hummer way and yeah. so i just want to really quickly go over the dimensions because they released the dimensions which are comical <laughs> uh so it's 93.7 inches wide with the mirrors so without is, it's still 86 and a half that's 13 inches wider than the Sequoia. Yeah, that's the that Sequoia is, is 80 massive. inches wide, mirror tip to mirror tip. <laughs> Probably wider than the than a smart car is long, I would guess. Probably. Oh, 100%. I mean, yes. <laughs> how long is the wheelbase of my Miata? <laughs> it's it's pretty it you're like 113, Ross. No, uh, my, the wheelbase of my car of my 2013 Miata is 91.7 inches. So it right. is wider with the mirrors than my car's and wheelbase. wheelbase. So, uh, Smart car length is 106. Oh my God. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Other dimensions very quickly. Uh, do, 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 do. Lots of suspension travel. We know that, but it's all air suspension. So it's not real suspension travel. They can quote anything they want. Wheelbase is 126.7. So it's four inches longer than an H2. And they have apparently said it will be heavier than the H2, which was 6,400 pounds. Um, that's so, that's, of course it will. Like yeah. H1 Hummers were like, what, 
8,500 pounds when they were like the civilian version? Like, yes, this is going to be close to that, but probably as big. Probably. So anyways, that's enough Hummer. We've talked about it enough. It's still, you know, a 2023 model year release. So I would, I want to know, David, have you, I'm, I'm jumping in. It's the worst segue ever. I'm just jumping, jumping straight to the question. David, have you been able to drive the, the Wrangler 392? Nope, not yet. Not yet? Okay. I was hoping you were close enough to Moab in the last couple of weeks. Uh, no, I've been stuck in this garage. For... <laughs> and you're, are you in Montana still? Uh, no, I'm near Seattle, just north of Seattle. Near Seattle, okay. Uh, yeah, a reader allowed me to work in his garage. That's what, that's what we're seeing here. He actually bought this forward control. He's a, re- a reader. He emailed me in July. He said, hey, there's a forward control for sale near me. You should buy it, LOL. And I was like, okay, here's 1500 bucks. Go buy it. He's like, what? <laughs> you got that for 1500 bucks? That's it? Oh, that's too much money. I mean, you, this thing's freaking toast. Um, I mean, I, okay. I have seen the Instagram stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, actually, I, I, I was really hesitant at first to buy it if there's anything i've learned from buying a bunch of junky cars over the years it's if you see something that you like man that you that's like just on the border of like do you want to spend that money you should just do it because you if it's a rare car like this i could spend another two years and and not find one that's suitable right chances are you can also if you despise it and need to get out of it immediately you can flip it and not you know lose your shirt no, I would lose my shirt on this, no doubt. No one's paying fifteen hundred dollars for this. I love, I love Fred's comment on your Instagram post. It's Fred oh, Williams just the hit, the hit the face palm. I'm just <laughs> been sending me videos and texts about this. It's like, what's the status update, man? What's the status update? Oh, like, wow, well, how do I not follow? I didn't realize I don't follow you. That is, it's crowd. so good. So Ford controls for me are my favorite version of classic Jeep, like the FC concept that was like at easter jeep like that big blue monster with the oh, yeah. giant truck bed was the best one i've that's my favorite easter jeep concept i did really like the com, uh, the commando this year but mm-hmm. yeah it's my boss it's rory rory my boss's favorite as well i i've seen it up close when i was at chrysler um they had it just kind of sitting around it's mighty fc it was called right mighty yeah. fc the it, interior on that thing was unbelievable too I've also seen somebody Photoshop it into a van, and I was like, "Well, hold on, let's 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 stop because we need to consider this." Actually, <laughs> <laughs> looks better than that. Uh, what was that thing we were looking at at the last few shows? I can't even remember. Oh, oh canoe. the canoe, the canoe. Yeah, <laughs> I like the canoe. Oh Lord. Oh man, David, that's ah. Uh... Where do you get classic Jeep truck seats? Oh, you go to a junkyard, grab a random seat, and make okay. bracket for it. Hope it fits or <laughs> fab it up. It's called fabrication. Damn, dude. Yeah, that's. I love it when there's plants growing out of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh... Sorry to the audio listener. Like David's pushing on panels of his Ford Control, and everything's wiggling, which is not a good sign. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, the bed. We're not. We're not helping him. <laughs> I know the the video watchers here are, are going to have a good telling, but uh, there's a lot of rust. Yeah, there's it's. Um, do you know the history behind it? Is there a story? Um, there's not a not that I know of. That the guy was selling it. Um, he was selling it. it apparently, apparently, it had sat on a farm for probably a couple of decades. Looks so, like it. He bought it for some from someone for five hundred bucks and flipped it to to some fool from Michigan. 1500 <laughs> uh, when i got here just, can, can i show you some some, some, some yeah. Yeah. yeah let's do it we don't so, normally have the guests give us a walk around while we're talking to them so this is great all right so yeah. <laughs> the thing obviously didn't run when i bought it uh didn't wasn't even close the engine did turn over i did a compression test compression should be like 100 to 130 or so on this it ended up being between zero and 30 across all six cylinders. Oh. Um, so I'm great. like, well, I hope it's not the piston rings because I'm not about to pop some <laughs> pistons out of this thing. Where does the engine it. live in that? So the engine is in the doghouse right there between uh-huh. the doghouse. And, and I always thought uh-huh. the doghouse would be an excellent place for it. You get to basically hang out with your engine while you're driving it. It's freaking epic. And if it's cold, 
you can you can basically have a, a garage built around mm-hmm. your freaking genius but actually it's terrible it really is <laughs> you gotta like you're on your knees on this metal thing i really should put a oh, pad you need a pad yeah um and then and also get how do you even get in this thing it's like really high and then like yeah <laughs> <it's>, maybe, <laughs> um okay so <laughs> that didn't sound at all. let me show you all the motor here so so david is now in the jeep for the people <laughs> listening <laughs> for you audio folks i am inside the jeep hanging out with an engine that sits between the driver and passenger oh man okay so there are these two covers that cover the engine um you just lift them up and boom you've got your motor now i took the cylinder head off mm-hmm. and um i discovered some valves that were stuck you can see they're like really rusty and crusty oh that. man so anyway i'm gonna be lapping valves by hand tonight it's gonna take forever oh boy um yeah here's a little look at the rest of it floor is a little yanked windscreen is cracked so it's got the it's got nature's air conditioning oh, with the the rust holes in the floor yeah, yeah i ambient, saw that ambient cooling it's the best kind <laughs> And if it's if the if you're getting too much cool, then you just take the cover off the engine bay, and you there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what engine is that? That is a Continental inline six flathead motor. That is, um, as I understand, a military engine. Mm. Okay. Uh, made by the company Continental, um, which built engines in Detroit. I've actually walked through their abandoned plant, which is right next to the Jefferson North Assembly plant where they build the Grand Cherokee. It okay. A big abandoned facility. Uh, says I think there's a tower that says Continental. Anyway, that's not really relevant. But point is, uh, yeah, it's actually a really cool engine. Flatheads are awesome. Yeah. Well, Continental Motors. It, it, yeah, I mean, the parts availability could be better. I have to be honest. <laughs> like a Willys design, that would be great. That would, yeah, that would open the options up substantially. I mean, that is, it's wild, but I, at what point is it easier to just pull the motor out? There it is. And just work on it on a stand. Wow, that is abandoned. <laughs> yeah, it is. So, it's also uh, Detroit. You can actually <laughs> like I said, there. abandoned. You can go <laughs> to that, that tower. It's, uh, yeah, it's filled with like old ashes and whatnot. You can go on, yeah, anyway. Um, I like abandoned stuff. Yikes, yikes, yikes. No, thank you scary so what i'm assuming once you saw this thing the immediate goal and the end goal might have if nothing else moved back on their timetable what what uh is there a new goal with the condition in mind or is it just get it running and i mean the goal was to buy it and drive it home um then and i mean if i could pull that off basically i'm just running out of money at this point because um (laughs) yeah like i'm I'm going to be sleeping in a Land Cruiser probably for the next five days. I've been in a motel because mm-hmm. I have to write, so I need the, the internet. Wi-Fi. Yeah. Yeah. Land Cruiser doesn't yet have Wi-Fi, and my phone is just not working out so hot. The plan now, I'm going to be living in this Land Cruiser, parked next to maybe McDonald's. Um, of course, I need to get a power inverter as well to charge charge stuff. But, um, yeah, the plan at this point, given how bad a shape it's in, I think the clutch might actually be stuck, is to get it running. <laughs> get it sort of driving and then tow it to an off-road course here in Washington and just off-road the crap out of it because the bar okay. for an off-road vehicle versus a vehicle that you're taking on the road, it's so much lower. Like you can take, like it doesn't <laughs> be remotely, you know, it doesn't have to handle well at all if it's off-road. Right. It's yeah. off-road now. So yeah. As long as the steering somewhat translates to the front end doing something like it, you're good. It barely does. But like, <laughs> fine. Barely. Have you have you Scary. off-roaded with, with a cab over before? Never. I've never offered okay. a cab over. Wow. I bet it would be. I bet it'd be great. Yeah. I. You. You have the ability. It's. It's easier to see what your front wheels are doing because you can literally just look down and a little see bit behind the you, front like, wheels. Well, yeah. I. I think the real bet. Like you can. You can. You know how when you're going to a, an incline, you're wondering if your approach angle is quite there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is your bumper gonna touch it. You literally just look down. Your windshield, you're like, <laughs> all right, it's not gonna yep. touch. Good. Or for you, yep. you just look through the floor. 
Like it's or yeah, you've true. built in approach angle monitor. <laughs> no, they have on. I think the new defender. They've got the uh, the can the under. Yeah. Press. It's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> All this is. is what's like, the uh, uh, analog? What's the weight balance on those? Oh gosh. I'm gonna guess like. Is it like seventy thirty with the engine up front? David, your audio cut out. We lost you. Dang it. Oh, no, now you're back. Now you're good. So this is the 170. Mm-hmm. This is the longer one. So it's probably, if I had to guess, 60-40 front, rear. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, maybe 70-30. It's, it's like good. there's not a lot of weight in that bed. Well, yeah. especially this bed. There's no metal left <laughs> on the bottom of it. <laughs> The spare helps though. <laughs> yeah, the spare helps. Just strap down like a high spare. lift and some extra. The Chevy shit hubcap. <laughs> this won't even bolt up. It's a completely irrelevant spare tire. I, I just... <laughs> Somebody had an extra tire that they got rid of in the back of your SC. junkyard. Bloop. That's funny. There's literally no point in this product. I just want to be clear. There is literally no point in me fixing this and driving it other than to just to it. The plan is to turn it into an electric vehicle to an EV conversion. Right. Amazing. Um, we've got. A bunch of engineers in the Michigan area, in the Detroit area, have volunteered to um, to help out with the conversion. Uh, from we're going to have a bunch of Zoom engineering meetings with uh, oh EV engineers from Ford and Chrysler and Tesla and Rivian and various car companies. And what's crazy is like they do this for work, but after work they're like, "Yeah, let's just do it again. Let's just." Yeah. Keep- that's how you how you know you get people passionate doing what they're doing. Like, yeah, right. Exactly. Their hobby is the exact same thing. <laughs> That's right. So I'm assuming the bed becomes the battery pack, basically. Like, yeah, yeah. I think I, either the battery goes in the bed, or the great thing with body on frame, and I and I think as EV conversions become more popular. I think body on frame vehicles are going to become the things to buy. Unibody vehicles mm-hmm. are going to be too difficult to modify you're going to have too many constraints right with a body on frame vehicle you can add brackets to the frame to hold a battery you can raise the body off the frame to make a little more space Mm -hmm. it's just a lot more versatile uh and you can do a body lift and literally just gap it so that pack fits between the two right exactly that's why when when chevy came out with their yeah when chevy came out with their ev blazer i was like wait you guys couldn't you couldn't at that bolt pack anywhere else like it's in the cargo area like you it, it would have fit underneath is all i would say uh, don't even talk about a blazer jeez <laughs> i just felt they were lazy with it like just threw the bolt pack in the back like, yeah not... yeah there were other options for that yeah um crazy all right well i mean obviously we're curious to see where this thing goes physically and metaphorically <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If and when. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to try to get it running either today or tomorrow. Um, check out the Instagram. That's usually where I do all the live stuff. Uh, I don't know. There's nothing like getting an engine running that has been sitting for like for decades. Uh, <laughs> well, just- I'll take your word for that. <laughs> I, it, it's on, it, it sounds so lame to say, use the term bucket list, but like getting an old vehicle with an old engine in it and making that engine work is what I want to do. Personally, I, I lean towards classic mini because mm-hmm. I just I'm I'm almost six four. I want to fit inside of that car. <laughs> classic mini is always a good move. I think it's hilarious to have me get out of the car and then be doubly as tall as the car is. Like I think that's that's great. My my friend um, from college, he's six five and he's obsessed with mini. It, it, it just I think I think you guys just like being real cozy. Well, they're roomier than <laughs> they're roomier than they appear, is what I would say. This is true. That being yeah. said, I haven't sat in a classic one yet. <laughs> You'll be fine. Yeah, that was internet research, but I just, I also like the horribleness of the British engineering on that engine setup and tiny radiators and all of like. And that's why you make it electric. Uh, no. We just talked about this, Ross. The amount you need space for batteries. You need. <laughs> You need right, a lot of money for that, and also yeah. money. Yeah. You make rear wheel drive an electric with a lot yeah. of money. I, okay, anyways, I, I went down the rabbit <laughs> hole of do-it-yourself EVs earlier 
during the pandemic because you get a lot of time sitting around. What are you going to do, right? So let me, let me look up how hard it is to modify a Range Rover into an EV. And all of a sudden you're like, hey, how'd we get to $25,000? How's that working out for Brad? I haven't checked in with him lately. Oh, mm. um, I really don't know. <laughs> so, so he basically he, bought a really cheap leaf and he wrapped owns it. One. Yeah. Yeah, the leaf. <coughs> like the leaf. He, he, he seems very adamant that he's not going to buy a car. Um, yeah, no, he's he's done with gas cars. He's all he's in. all in. I mean, I'm I'm going to probably drive ICE cars until until I am no longer legally allowed to. Um, I love EVs from a technical standpoint because a lot of it is because of the newness. Mm-hmm. Um, but from a driving standpoint, um, they don't do it for me really. Even even like the Porsche Taycan, mm-hmm. like you know, the probably probably the most exciting mainstream EV if I had to guess. Um, it's quick, but it's not. A, I mean, if you go from a Taycan to a GT350, you will not. You you will not <laughs> go back to the Taycan. The GT350 is like right. It's incredible. Yeah, like one is like elevator music, and one's like a freaking mm-hmm. rock rock show, you know. But okay, to play devil's advocate, that's coming from somebody who's been driving since before EVs were prevalent. Mm-hmm. If somebody was, you know, had never been around cars, knows nothing about cars, never drove a car or sat in a car, and had the opportunity to ride in both of them back to back, it would be very interesting to hear you know what that opinion would be but i'm curious to pick your brain about electric off-roaders because you know jeep just had you know they've the four xe's out they're they're being delivered but one of the big concepts for uh easter jeep safari this year was i think they called it magneto which they did jury is out on how that name fared but six-speed manual electric you know rubicon everything so i mean you said obviously you preferred combustion engine vehicles but how do you feel about for the off-road purpose alone i'll be clear that i actually for, for a commuter i would prefer an ev if i'm commuting every day commutes are not exciting like you're going to work and back it should be an ev that's a responsible thing uh and it's quieter and more comfortable but like as an enthusiast car all day and i see okay mm-hmm. yeah the magneto um i sort of poked some fun at this uh car in an article a few weeks ago um, I called it a, it looks as if it was designed by high school shop class. <laughs> um, because if you look at their sort of cutaway, it, it literally looks like they put a motor on the input shaft of, uh, their six speed manual transmission, which is what they do in, you know, college EV conversion classes, very mm-hmm. basic. Um, and if you compare it to anything else that's production, like it looks childish, um, but EV off-roaders as a concept is great, and and but I do and I also think EV manuals as a concept. So there we go. There's a little little cutaway. Okay, here here is my main my main qual uh, issue with this. Like, why do you need the transmission gearing and the transfer case gearing and the diff gearing? It's like it makes no <laughs> sense. It really doesn't. Um. Yeah, so that's it, it's clearly just an adaptation of the, the GL, which is fine, but like mm-hmm. it's a production car. But, um, yeah, it's not a production car to be clear, but if it were, I would laugh at it. Well, um, probably EV, someday. Yeah, I mean, EV off roaders, they have a lot of potential to really, uh, to really get some granular, um, uh, um, wheel speed control, like on a level that we've not seen before. Um. Like it could crawl incredibly slowly. Traction control could be more immediate than ever. Right, and we've discussed independent wheel control too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, EVs off road have so much potential. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I'm looking forward to actually getting uh, a chance to drive at, at the very least the 4xe in EV mode off road. Um, yeah. They haven't, nobody's driven that yet, right? They're delivering them, but there haven't been, like, journalists haven't the, the final, had time in them. The final press drive is happening right now, right? Just in the next couple of days in Texas. As we speak. David, your audio has gone super quiet all of a sudden. What about now? Still sounds the same. All right, let me get my, uh, 
Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's so strange that, I mean, sometimes they do that and press drives are just, you know, concurrent with deliveries because the press drive isn't going to affect sales all that much. But I know for a fact that there are four XEs being delivered and that have been in, you know, an owner buyer hands for like a good, probably two or three weeks. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. With, with all of the weirdness of, of Bronco deliveries right now, like, I don't, th- I think Jeep is like, nah, we're good. Yeah, probably. <laughs> like Jeep, Jeep's probably not probably. worried about 4XE, like, especially if they're delivering to customers already. They're like, yeah, we don't need to worry about the press. Like, the Ford's way behind right, the Broncos. Right, right. We're way good. That picture reminds me and reminded me that they're actually building 4XE, you know, like luxury trims. I, I always forget that it's not just the Rubicon 4XE that they're selling. It's like every trim. <laughs> it's, it is like every trim. Uh, yeah the so, 4xe i bet you could okay how's the audio is it okay fantastic. very good yeah okay it's too loud all right uh the 4xe <laughs> it could be a great deal uh if you get the right incentives federal and state you really you, it could be uh, i haven't really dug into it but i i could see those selling pretty well even if they only have like 20 miles of range 21 think, yeah 21 they they start at 47 grand in the yeah, Gold. so and then what? There's probably a seventy five hundred dollar tax credit federal. Uh, do those get extended? Well, I do they I not? don't think Jeep Jeep hasn't reached it. There's a certain number. There's a certain volume that you have to reach before those mm-hmm. drop off. Okay. Certainly, uh, Chrysler hasn't gotten to that volume. No, oh, no. <laughs> so they they, they are a long way to go. <laughs> Ross, to, to your point, they're building them in three trims, Sahara, Rubicon, and high altitude. Okay, so. And it's 47 to 53 for starting. Wow. It's literally two, two yeah. or no, I mean, it's almost four grand and then a two grand jump. You know, when I was at Chrysler, the only EV they built was the 500. Um, and I recall being at an, I think I was an intern 2012, uh, Sergio Marchionne was given a speech to the interns mm-hmm. and he let some interns ask questions. Oh God. Um, something <laughs> came up about EVs or whatever. And Marchionne, he really hated the fact that Chrysler had to sell the 500E as a compliance car. He, he's like, <laughs> he, he said, we're losing 15 grand on each one of these. I hope no one mm-hmm. buys them. Really? Um, yeah he says he says something like absurd about how much money we were losing uh, Chrysler was losing on it they were supposed um, to be actually not bad cars for the you know 199 a month yeah i've heard they're not bad he also answered an intern asked him what his three favorite cars in the world are um he answered um the ferrari uh, i think i think he had a 360 of his own no an enzo he had an enzo um, of course he did. Yep. Uh, an Audi RS6 uh, wagon. Um, and then the third one was the Dodge Charger RT all-wheel drive. Huh. Pretty random. Pretty random. The RT, does that, RT at least means it was a V8, right? V8 all-wheel drive, which is 5.7. Yeah. Oddity in of itself, but well, still. That's, that's two V8 all-wheel point. drives the rs6 wagon and <laughs> keys very and odd en- and enzo's only rear wheel drive right yeah. yes okay i don't i don't know supercars enough don't need to somebody will correct you if you're wrong so david what what got you started buying sight unseen jeeps um well i i've been a, kind of obsessed with jeeps since i was a kid um, I lived in Kansas when I was in high school. There wasn't a whole lot to do in Kansas. Still not. Um, still not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> especially in high school, like we would basically just, um, go off roading, uh, along the Missouri river floodplain yep. all the time against like our parents told us, like they forbid us, but we did it anyway. <laughs> um, as you do in high school. And it was a, a ZJ grand Cherokee 98 bare stock, <laughs> totally stock full time transfer case it was fine but we beat the crap out of it and it was those adventures with my brothers 
uh, on the Missouri River floodplains that got me into Jeep. And I was like, okay, I'm, about, I'm mm-hmm. trying to work for Jeep when I get older. So I studied engineering, um, somehow met the right people, ended up getting to Chrysler exactly when the JL program started. Really? Um, yeah, right when I got there, they're like, hey, we're starting the JL program. Who wants it? And it, was, it was me and we had, we had a bunch of team members. <laughs> And they were like, okay, here are all the programs we're working on. We got Pacifica, we've got the K8, which is the, the, um, what's that one? The, the one in from China, the oh. command, I don't, I forgot exactly. Um, oh, the lineage V, yeah. Um, it's the, it's, it's the Jeep Cherokee base. Uh, and it has the weird tail lights in the back, right? Yeah. The, it was the commander? N- Grand Commander, there it is. Okay, yeah, the Grand, Grand Commander. Commander, right? But doesn't yes. it have like Cherokee tail? Hold on, stand by. It's based. It's based on the KL platform, but we're kind of getting in the weeds here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So there was Pacifica. There was um, the K8 Grand Commander. There was the DT Ram. Um, and then there was Viper, and there was JL, and then there was WL Grand Cherokee. There were a bunch of platforms, and my boss was like, "Who wants what?" Uh, I looked around. I'm like. I'm trying to get Wrangler and Viper and everybody else is like, I don't care, man. I was like, wow. really? I'm actually, that's surprising. I'm like, what do you mean? You don't care. Are you kidding me? Are you going to like slide in at the last minute? And my boss is like, okay, you're Viper and, uh, and Wrangler. Viper got canceled as you know. Yeah. Um, but we were just starting and I was, um, the systems integration responsible. So SIR, I, I was in charge of, uh, cooling system design. I was basically the cooling system architect for, the batteries, the transmissions, the engines. Um, and I also had to make sure stuff didn't catch fire if it was too close to exhaust. <laughs> Basically, it was powertrain cooling and then thermal management. And then there's aero all comes into play there as well. Mm-hmm. Aero and cooling are like two of the same. They're, um, you, you have a close buddy. Yeah, yeah right. A lot, a, lot of, a lot of hanging out with uh, aerodynamicists and, and designers. Uh, yeah, so I did that. Oh, I will say my best day of work, one of my best days of work, <laughs> we were testing this, uh, this duct uh, in the belly pan of the, of the JL. So we were trying to get a few more cubic feet per minute uh, of airflow into our radiator because we were not meeting our J2807 trailer tow targets. Um, so we were like, okay, well, w- the problem with the JL is that there's no lower opening. You look at any okay. other Jeep product, you've got a lower opening, but with the JL, mm-hmm. it's Bumper and, every, and everything has to be above it because of approach angle. So you've got your seven slots and that's it. That's all you can do for airflow. Yeah, here we go. Um, if you look directly under the bumper, there is this little belly pan, as we called it. It's basically a little, it's an arrow shield that directs airflow underneath the front axle um, to, reduce, uh, to do, reduce drag. We built a little ramp. There was a little rectangular hole in it with a little ramp that shot air that shot air up into the radiator got us like i don't know 35 cfm or something i don't remember exactly what it was wow it was not a ton it was not a ton honestly but it was like we were really and if you look at this at at this image you'll see the the grill texture like we were fighting with uh the the pd the product design office we're like dude don't put any grill texture in there keep them wide open (laughs) on the the jk better for you Yep. The JK, yep. they're wide open. They're like, oh, we want the texture. I'm like, dude, you don't understand that the amount of airflow we lose just from that texture, it's just not worth it. Clearly, they won. They won that battle, it looks like, <laughs> uh, after I left. But um, anyway, the best day, one of the best days of work, we were testing this belly pan deck because, you know, you can't just, with the Wrangler, it's different. You can't just like come up with a design and, okay, that's now, um, what was the term they used for like, um, there was a term at, used at Chrysler that meant like it's official now, like oh. it's uh, it's now officially part of the, the program. It, it'll it'll come to, come to me in a second. And it wasn't canon. N- no, <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> there is a word. Anyway, it'll come to me. But um, you can't just do that because you have to you have to test it to make sure that it's not going to be a, a detriment off road. So we built a an sla um just sort of a a prototype part and we mounted it to a jk and um 
that we went to an off-road park near near the headquarters in Auburn Hills, and I just went mudding all day. And the goal was to try to pack this little opening with mm-hmm. mud. Um, and it, we we were testing for mud pack or uh, mud intrusion. Um, and that's literally, they were like, try to fill that thing with mud. And if it fills with mud, then it's not going to work out. Yeah. That's a good day at work. I couldn't get it filled. You know, I have to say mud <laughs> gets everywhere, but you know where mud doesn't get when you're off-roading the place it you want it doesn't get right directly below the front bumper. It doesn't, I mean, it just like, it's hard to, cause you know, when you hit a mud puddle, your tires are basically acting like big paddles that push the mud straight forward. If you're, if you're turned, then you, you know, the treads will shoot some mud up, but like, it's never going to get directly below the front bumper. It's not going to happen. So it actually passed though. It, it never became uh, never thought became, about that. Yeah. Didn't make it to production. That's too bad. Searching like crazy for lower front end. Photos <laughs> and there are not a lot. I was searching for crazy <laughs> words. Chrysler uses for official. <laughs> Yeah, um, um, no, it'll come to me. Yeah, it'll come to me eventually. That's a good day of work, though. Here, go out and just drive through the mud and see if you can you can clog it up. That's that that was right. the job. If I day. if I have to. <laughs> yeah, that was ridiculous. Every every shot that's low enough is an aftermarket bumper. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, that's like it's such a random shapes. spot. Yeah. It's such a random spot there. So like that's that, but that's something to think about, like. If you guys have done that much research and engineering behind to redirect airflow from underneath the bumper, and then somebody pulls all that off and slaps something from an aftermarket company there, like oh, it'll affect everything. Yeah, we don't. I I would not have thought about that affecting my cooling because there are seven grills that are still there on top. Yeah, but in reality, no, yeah, we just took parts everything away. Makes, everything makes a difference. I mean, everything you know what what's really surprising is how big of a difference uh fan spacing can be uh the space between the fan and the radiator there i remember we were doing a study on at at a certain point if you if you pull the fan back from the radiator and you've got it shrouded you get to a point where you get an advantage from from airflow and then you reach diminishing returns and actually gets worse so there's like an optimal fan spacing the seals the seals between the grill and let me use this as an example. <laughs> Let's just imagine that there was actually 80 years. Ra- well, no, imagine uh, 60 years. <laughs> yeah. Imagine that there were actually a radiator back here and not just this metal here. The, if you have a gap around here inside your grill between your radiator and your grill, your air is going to hit the radiator and it's going to create a positive pressure in front of the radiator because it's hard to get through that tight fin and tube, the tight fin and tubes. So you've got this positive pressure. If you have gaps in here, all, the air is just going to go around. There's that's a path of least resistance. That's how it works. So if you can really seal off the spacing between your your uh, grill opening and your radiator, the advantage from an airflow standpoint is remarkable. So huh. don't ever don't ever remove any of the sealing. It's a big deal. <laughs> Keep the shrouds. Yeah, shrouds are hot. Ross, what did you send pun? me? I sent you what I think is a 3D model. I mean, oh, it's, wow. it is, it, it's 3D pictures, but whether it's accurate or not, I have no idea because it's... Plan of record. Plan of record. Plan That's of it. record. There plan you go. of record. That's pl- is that plan of record? Yeah. And if it's not plan of record, it doesn't count. <laughs> it, it's not official yet. But as soon as you've designed something and it becomes plan of record, it's in the CAD, it's... It's legit. Ooh, look at this cat. Speaking yeah, of. Just say that Ross found cat. Yeah, whether it's real or not, I, mean, I, I <laughs> no, no, can't vouch was, for it. That's all, everything looks good there. Yeah, you, you can tell it's a JL for well a number of reasons. No, the fuel tank. Yeah. Notice the fuel tank skip plate has some ribbing in it. Yes. On the JK, it was flat, which is so dumb. You've got no stiffness on a flat <laughs> skip plate. So if you talk to the hardcore JK off-roaders, they'll all be like, "Yeah, my fuel tank takes two and a half gallons less than it did." Right, because they're bashed in from rocks. Or, <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yep. So my my TJ, one of my my, I took it to a, a camp jeep in Charlottesville. Whoa, and- hold on, camp jeep? That dude, you're aging yourself. That was like a hundred years ago. 
I'm I'm like from a hundred years ago. I'm forty, so like, I'm old. Gosh, you look way younger than I do. What What have I been doing with my life? What have, what have, what have well, you, he's I, got a haircut. I got a haircut hair hair for one, and I have not been buying <laughs> sight unseen and trying to get them going. So that's true. This is definitely taking go. some time off me and hair yeah. off me too. But like I, can, I the the only two things I did was I went and got a, a new skid plate for the gas tank like i that was i got a steel one uh and i I did that i did a steering box one and i think that was the only two skid plates i did um and i dropped the entire truck on that gas tank skid plate like i came down off a boulder kind of thing wasn't it stock height too yeah oh yeah stock height uh goodyear sras were the tires like i didn't do anything uh but like i was so glad i bought that skid plate (laughs) it was got underneath there and found the scratches on the skid plate. And I was like, mm. Mm. but there were no leaks. So. Yeah. Yeah. Those things are, I think on JK, they're, ra- they're rated to hold like one and a half of GVW or something. I don't remember exactly. Really? But they're GVW might be a bit much. That's, that's okay. It's like, that's, a lot <laughs> that's hold. Everything. That's not yeah. hold and blunt force are different entities. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. Say so it might, it I might don't, I don't rest exactly on it, the chest is, but <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like uh, Emmy Hall's story about hitting a like, oh, was she in a Chevy Colorado and punched the skid plate up? Yeah, and so then like the skid plate had, I think, was it a as long as it wasn't Buddy? Tra- no, it's not Buddy, but it was like a <laughs> transmission drain plug or a transfer case drain plug came out, but they what? bent this, yeah. But they bent the skid plate in a way that it all of the transfer case fluid pooled. In the skid plate, so they didn't even know that they were leaking. That is ridiculous. Uh, that's why Rebel Rally is awesome, and more manufacturers should compete there because you're gonna do things there that's not gonna happen. You will have never otherwise figured that out that that yeah. can happen. But you think there was a big off road thing recently because I know Emmy posted stuff, and I saw other photographers posting. Is it Valley? Oh, uh, God. I saw that Emmy was out with the new hyundai santa cruz was she saw pictures yeah i don't know no i know she was filming you know studio stuff with it not like wheeling it unfortunately not yet well, I, I, that's i think hyundai let a lot of people go because i think everybody's embargo lifted today so it, did. it jeff, did jeff had a video <laughs> jeff was uh, like oh yeah i was already there yeah we don't that's do embargoes a, valley valley off-road racing association hawthorne course over the weekend there was a big off-road race yeah, Emmy doesn't play around. She she uh, overheated uh, for Bronco Sport. Um, Did she? she? I yeah, I interviewed her for uh, my story about the Ford Bronco Sports four wheel drive system thermal concerns. Huh? Yeah, she doesn't she doesn't mess around, man. She's, she's how, sending it. How do you overheat a four wheel drive system? Oh, it's easy. If it's a front wheel drive based, uh, yeah, it's vehicle, not a it's, real four wheel drive system. Yeah, if it's clutch based, you'll overheat that stuff easily. Okay. Easy. Yeah, so uh, yeah same system as like the escapes and things because they're i mean it's all basically the same size isn't it uh, i think <sighs> there's a, a lot of commonality with like the focus rs system really uh, okay the rear end um, but yeah it's just clutch based you're basically relying on friction in clutches which is going to correspond it's going to yield heat uh, somebody made the comment the other day that the uh, Bronco Sport looks more like a Land Rover than the Range Rover Evoque does. It looks more like a Freelander than the Evoque does. Like it, if you look at like the somebody's been really nice and done a Defender Bronco Evoque uh, comparison for me. <laughs> so an like, Evoque convertible yesterday. Thank. Oh yeah. You know th- this is the kind of stuff I would have done when I, I was like, like 13, 14. Just same. Like- <laughs> Same. put some cars together and just like yeah. show my brothers hey which one's best which one's best well like the okay, defender of- and the bronco sport look like they line up they really do i see so many defenders here it's crazy i don't know where Dude, all the- that money comes from i think the bronco sport's gonna sell uh, just ridiculous i bet you it's already selling really well my wife we were watching top chef the other night and they had a commercial for the bronco sport and then she texted me the following morning saying i'm behind the bronco sport I said and and she said, it looks terrible. Said, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Big breath there. Big breath. I don't know if it looks, I don't know if it looks terrible, but what, what uh, is your She has a CX-5. Oh, uh, is it a newer one or? 19. 
Okay. Yeah. My, my, uh, my brother drove a, a new CX-5 and he, and he's like an enthusiast. He's like, dude, mm-hmm. I'm surprised. This is actually pretty deep. I'm like, don't even say it's decent. It's I know. Crossover. Don't even say it. I, so Glucker was the one that steered yeah. us in that direction. I didn't want to believe him. And then we went and test drove it and we we're like, she was like, yeah, it's really comfy and there's heated seats and I like it and it's nice and easy to drive. And I was driving and I was like, fuck, I can't it, say anything. You've gone so <laughs> No, I, I haven't. <laughs> I put I put 250 miles on on Chris's Chris sold me his forerunner. It has just shy of it'll hit 270, I think, if not tomorrow, then next week. But yeah, I put 250 miles on a 270,000 mile forerunner this week. I've not gone soft. <laughs> I'm only playing. I'm only playing. I know. It's just like, but, I know. It's like, yeah. It's sometimes the CX-5 when I get into- is the uh, auto journalist wife vehicle of choice. It's it's the auto journalist wife version of you have to drive the brown diesel manual wagon. Because <laughs> yeah. like, I, I know like Lane from uh, Driving While Awesome, like they, they had a Mazda and he went to a Forester. And Lane's like, it's the worst thing ever because it's Subaru electric steering in a Forester. Like he, and he's like, man, I really kind of wish we had the CX-5 back. Like, no, you, no, you don't. Um, not that it's a direct comparison, but I have kept up with 911s and other sports cars on the back roads here in her CX-5. Wow. Doesn't say much about the people driving those cars. <laughs> No, the CX-5. <laughs> or for her tires, which are <laughs> complaining, but squealing. It's a, it's such it's such a good car. And I just spent five days with a Kia Seltos, which was like almost oh. the same price. And, and? It, I mean, all right. So it's good. It's very good. There's a ton of car for the money, but there were a bunch of things that just it was a so it was a 2020 model year, not a current and it felt like there were a bunch of systems that were almost there you know there were a lot of things they included to check the boxes like you know uh radar cruise cruise control worked great but the hands-free driving system that keeps you in the lane just basically like like it was like bowling with bumpers you know it just bounced off one and bounced off the other and bounced off and so this is the cheapest all-wheel drive crossover, right? And it comes standard with all-wheel drive. Yep. That, that's what makes it so interesting to me. It's dirt. It's like twenty. What is it? Like twenty-two thousand starting with the one I had was almost thirty. I don't know about what they start at, but it has a center diff lock button. I wonder if it's just some clutches that sort of. Yeah. It just. Wow. Yeah. It it like, doesn't have like a transfer case, so yeah. yeah. What's 20, it really twenty one nine. Wow, starts so at cheap. cheap. Starts at twenty one. What does a Man. cross truck start at? Oh, God, we we have car. complained a lot about new car prices on this podcast. I am mm. not complaining about the Kia Seltos. Twenty two two for a cross truck. I mean, I don't know. The Seltos was nice. It was comfortable. I put probably almost six hundred miles on it, and the only complaints I had were about you know nuanced technology things. So. Can you still get a cross check with a manual or did they take that option away? They changed the engine. So I don't know if the trans migrated with it, but that was, I think one of the slowest new vehicles I've ever driven was the cross track. Well, Cause it was the CVT probably. It was, yeah. It was, I'm, Zero I, to 60 was like 10 great two. audio is searching the <laughs> answers to my questions. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you, so chris you're you're in kansas city ross you're in connecticut connecticut okay okay mm-hmm. uh and sadly both um well i don't know anything about this podcast like <laughs> i really don't like <laughs> i all i did i think i asked you if you were like involved in any sort of like you, you asked what our affiliations were yeah <laughs> right <laughs> trying to make sure you're not like you know you know funding any like strange yeah so, we uh we have no funding and we supply no funding. So <laughs> yeah, right, okay. We got we got stickers for you. We'll mail you some stickers. Yeah, yeah send yeah, me your address. I'll mail you some stickers. So so what how'd you guys get into off-road vehicles? I know oh, you're supposed man. to be interviewing me, but like yeah. It's, so for for the dedicated listener, this is just a recap, so we, we won't go too long. Mm-hmm. Um I I 
I didn't realize that I wanted to deal with cars until I was like almost in my thirties. Huh. Like I was a middle school teacher. I taught science for forever. And then uh, I basically started my own car blog um, and just drifted towards off-road more and more and more. So I had the Jeep when I was in my early twenties. Um, I haven't owned an actual car since I owned the Jeep. It was the Jeep, the Jeep went to a, a Highlander, to a Tundra, to a Yukon XL, to the Forerunner for a day before it became my wife's, um, to a Tacoma, <laughs> to a 94 Land Cruiser, and now I'm in an 08 Sequoia. So there's been a lot of Toyota throughout it. He likes Toyotas. Yeah, we'll get to Toyota later. I saw tread on uh or thread on twitter earlier we can talk about oh boy um mm. but that would that would ruin the affiliations that david was trying to avoid so um <laughs> i i've just yeah i always like the off-road stuff i don't know and plus yeah. i have four kids so the p- performance vehicle doesn't exactly work in my life it does so- if you can afford like an e63 wagon with jump seats so have you gone off road? have you taken your kids off road yes so uh, in the 94 Land Cruiser, we did uh, a couple of trips um, and I would have hung on to the Land Cruiser, but uh, 94, no airbags, um, 25 year old seat belts, no latch system. And uh, it was just getting a little too sketch. So I actually bought the Sequoia to keep both. But once I kind of had the Sequoia, the 5.7, the airbags, the seatbelts, the latch system, it just kind of, the other one. And you're not doing anything in a situation where you like need, you know, three lockers. Yeah. Like we're, we're definitely more fire roads, some, some relatively easy to track. Like we're not a rock crawling family, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm willing to throw it into mud. Like, well, we've done some. Come to the Northeast. We can do some rock crawling. Do your kids enjoy it? I bet your kids have a great time when you go out, huh? Um, they do have a pretty good time. My, I, <laughs> I got to find the photo now, Ross. Uh, with, there was a picture of the Land Cruiser as we did like a water crossing. And I didn't realize that my son sitting in the back. Um, oh, man, where are those photos? Uh, but he was like in the back seat with both arms in the air, like totally oh, roller coaster yeah like totally pumped up like this was the greatest thing <laughs> uh he had ever done and i at the time like he was god he was probably only six or seven at the time so for him like like oh here i got found one of him like so like for a couple of them like it, it they they have kind of like they were old enough they could immediately go with me kind of thing my youngest son uh just went camping with me this last time and he literally the other day was like hey when are we going camping again and i was like you hated it you yelled (laughs) at me the whole time your ipad didn't work like you were so frustrated but even then he's already like can we go again i want to i want to go again like it it just gets under your skin i think so you know the very first time i ever went off-roading was with my dad, uh, and all, all my brothers, five of us, uh, six of us were in the back of a Humvee uh, in Germany. <laughs> it, was, it was a take your kids to school day, uh, to work day rather, take your kids to work day. Uh, and it was in the winter and we went on a tr- this, this training area in Hohenfels called The Box. And it was basically, yeah, where they just did a bunch of like tactical training. Um, and so, yeah, he just, uh, the highlight of that was there was a, basically a big pond. And my dad is a really risk averse, like, you know, does everything by the book. And I don't know why he decided to change his, like, go-to method in life <laughs> in this moment. He said, everybody step out. I'm like, what do you mean? Why are we stepping out? And uh, he got it stuck in the pond. And <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Oh, look at this. That's. That's my kid in the back with his arms in the air, just Isn't having a blast. That's <laughs> pretty funny. So that's also uh, the Arkansas River in Western Kansas that's never supposed to have water in it and had water in it the two days we were there. <laughs> that's cool. That's great. Nice river crossing. Yeah. It's very, very calm and mellow. All right, Ross, your turn. Let's hear it. Same thing. My dad <laughs> was exactly the same. 
identical. No, my dad, uh, he bought, he had, you know, a few off-road vehicles prior, but he bought a Wrangler, he bought a YJ new in 89, a couple years before I was born. And then I was probably three or four. And he, you know, he was a, he was a weekend wheeler, um, would go to, you know, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, Massachusetts, and, and, uh, go off-roading. And then he took me when I was probably three or four and that was it, you know, um, went with him every opportunity I had. And then eventually I was pro- I think I was like 13. He sold the Jeep and we got into ATVs, but by then I was already into cars on my own. So I kind of had my own automotive path. And since then, yeah, we've, we've kept up on the ATV side of things. <laughs> uh, he and my brother have since gone and gotten into UTVs. I've stuck to the quads, but you know, I, I took my dad off-roading in my first forerunner uh, a couple of years back. So it's just, you know, it, it's been something that I've been involved with basically since I was born. Um, you know, there's pictures of me in like a car seat in the woods. So <laughs> it's just, it's always been my life, you know, and, and I've gotten a little bit into autocross and sports cars and such, but it, it always comes back to. So, so UTVs. Force. Um, yeah. I've only ever driven one of them and it was the Mahindra mm-hmm. Roxer when it came out. <laughs> Those things are awesome. And I need to find a way to get my hands on one because so I assume now like, they don't sell them anymore because of the copyright. Yeah. Suit. They've got well, this weird design now, but yeah. Well, now- they went from stealing the Wrangler front end to now they steal the old FJ40 front yeah. end. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> now they have something even like totally different. It, oh, it's uh, that's as close as you can get to a brand new CJ Jeep, though. Like I, they're closer to that than they are to you know a Polaris Razor. You know the transfer case looks exactly like a CJ2A transfer case. Does it? Really why? Good. Yeah. Huh. Is this the new one? That's it. Oh god, that is fucking heinous. <laughs> you know, I think it's cute. That's what I. You know, it looks so different. You know what's funny? It's like looks like fucking Wally. I know it does look like Wally. Look how, <laughs> how, it looks happy. It's like look, let's go off roading. Yeah. Uh, so here's the thing about this. What I love about it is it's so obviously like the cheapest way they could modify this. Mm. So interestingly, okay, the, the the hood looks like it's it looks like it's a different hood. Yeah, um, it does which is not cheap, but you, you'll see that the fender there, it's basically straight. It goes right over top of the wheel. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, so they, they basically, they, let's see, what did they change? The fender, I assume, is, lar- is definitely changed. The hood, and then there's sort of this front piece here. This, this stuff here. Yeah, but otherwise, it's like probably exactly the same. It like looks like the, the headlights are set wider, I think, now. But they bought two new tools and changed two molds to do that. Yeah, I think it's great. I mean, it so, doesn't, the problem is, it's like, is it compelling at all anymore? It doesn't look like a Jeep. Mm, I don't know. No. Here, here's, I, if, if, here's if the you Jeep could convert version. it back, I think you could convert it back. Oh, though. that's so good. The Jeep version's definitely. Oh, better. so good. So, so I take it you enjoyed it. Oh yeah, it was great. I had a great time. Diesel. Manual mm-hmm. transmission. Manual. Yep. There was some really silly stuff, but like, man, like the, the park brake runs into the shifter. Like, okay. uh, it's just like a lot of, and then there's Wait. no rear seats. The early ones, there's no rear seat. So like, if you put it in reverse, are you still there, David? Still there. Uh, I just left flat. Awesome. Solid axles, diesel, manual. What more do you want? Yeah. How much is a Roxer? <laughs> Seriously. I think it was like 20. They were like 17 and change or something when they started, I think. Okay. And how much? So, uh, David, we $16, had $16,000. We had on uh, Kevin Ray from UTV Driver. Um, and I, I was convinced that I think I know which way direction I'm heading next uh, would be a four seater Yamaha R Max. Um, Just but that's, 25 G's to get there. That's the problem, though. So, how do you? So, 
how do you justify you TVs versus so I'll tell you how my father justifies it. My dad justifies it because I mean, given he bought all of his machines used, so it's not like he's you know spending even fifteen thousand dollars on them. But his mentality is at the end of the day, if it breaks, when it breaks, I put it on the trailer, I trailer it home. I fix it over the weekend. I don't have to rely on it to get me get back from the trail or get me to work on Monday morning, you know? Yeah, you can so, really rip it, right? Without any consequences, really. They are, well, no, they're not as consequence free as you think they are. <laughs> oh, yeah? it, it doesn't work like that. Remember, he said he no. did buy the used one. So somebody else has beat on it first. Well, not just that. <laughs> like, I mean, you can maintain them all you want and you can still, you know, drive it we went up to New Hampshire a few years ago and for reference, I did like 230 miles on two days on my quad, which was unbelievable and exhausting in a way. I didn't know it could be exhausting, but it was amazing. And my dad's uh, driver's side rear axle let go on mile six, even though we had done like a full inspection the night before we left, you know, so they're not consequence free, but the reality is like, they're just getting more and more prevalent. If parts had been available at the time, he probably could have fixed it in the parking lot that morning and been right. back on the trail that afternoon. And even so we were nine hours away in North New Hampshire and just dumped it on the trailer. And that was it versus once upon a time when I was a child, the rear U joint let go on his YJ and we drove it home four and a half hours in front wheel drive, which is fun. Wow. No, like that's a, a that, that's a classic yeah. move. So but I, I will say, whoa, drive home. But I will say, the beauty of a U, of U joint is like, you literally just need a tiny U joint and a rock, and like maybe well, some pliers. Yeah. yeah, if somebody has one. Well, yeah, but you gotta take a U joint with you to the trail. Okay. This All was right. this was <laughs> like 1995. Like we didn't prepare, you know, we just drove there and this was pre preparation, the, dude. Oh, like <laughs> the preparation level, honestly, and probably because of the prevalence of the internet, people prepare in ways they never did before, you know, like how, when was the last time you heard of somebody getting a vehicle stuck on the trail and having to abandon it and go back and rescue it? That uh, used to happen all the time. That did I, used to no? happen all the time. I, I and, got a and now it's like for you. Okay. Or that's group. <laughs> yeah but that's like super specific now it's like everybody has u joints everybody has tie rod ends and ball joints and emergency rescue shit for when things go wrong kinetic versus groups. yeah yeah or you know max like tracks max tracks and and crazy power winches versus in the night like when i was growing up and i'm sure the same thing with you guys like you went into the woods you had a high lift jack if something went wrong worse than that it was every resource you had to either get the vehicle out or get yourself out. You, you know? call a buddy up and they show up. At, you know, in high school, we had one guy. He was, uh, he was our go-to buddy. We got <laughs> to some shit. We got Oh no, he froze. We got to <laughs> all the time and if you would come out that's your dude right now okay david i got bad news yep you you froze as soon you as you started to say thing because the internet was yeah it was bad <laughs> it looks like you're almost back <laughs> all right how are we looking okay okay success basically now, now you're back completely <laughs> yeah yeah in high school basically we had this dude who we could call at the, in the middle of the night he had a he had a yj and he knew if he was getting a call at midnight he was heading to his yj with a toe strap but he was <laughs> everybody needs that person you know yeah 100 those those uh those yellow toe straps I feel like have done so much work. Oh man, with the like this the metal hook on the end. No, no, no! Don't get no, the metal no. hook. You gotta get the well, loops. You get the, the, 90s, the two that's what, loops. What, that's what we had. Yeah, the two loops are so much better. Valid and it's like points. twenty feet long, a couple inches wide, and that was that's how we got jeeps unstuck. Oh. Yeah, what a world! 
crazy, crazy. Well, so, sweet. Yeah. Dave, do you have anything that you want to promote? Is David still there? He's moving. He's thinking. Um, <laughs> no, just read my articles on Jalopnik. Um, all right. I don't know what's going on with the internet. I'm working in a garage in somewhere in Washington <laughs> State. Um, <laughs> no, I, I've got nothing to promote other than if you would like to see a man try to get this FC running after you know, sitting probably 20 some years. Um, and pr- the goal is to take it to an off road trail. It doesn't, the transmission, it doesn't, the clutch is stuck. The engine has no compression and I have about six days. So if you're, if you're trying to see this, check out my Instagram, <laughs> check out Jalopnik. Otherwise that's about it. Sweet. Well, I hope it works out. Yeah, definitely. I, I, we're rooting for off-road trail. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We've watched, we've watched enough dirt every day to see one, like if it can make it even a little bit on the trail that counts as being on the trail. Yeah. Uh, it's a fact. It's a fact. <laughs> so sweet. I'm going to wrap up the show. Uh, you can rate and review us on iTunes. You can like, and subscribe on YouTube. Uh, this might be an episode where uh, going back and checking the video is important. Cause there was a lot of video Definitely. stuff that, that made a lot of sense there. Uh, David is at David N Tracy on Instagram and Twitter, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, And you can read David's articles on Jalopnik. Uh, Ross and I sometimes write stuff on Hooniverse. Sometimes it's... Kia Seltos review coming soon. Is it really? Yeah, Yeah, promise. I still need to recap the the (laughs) snow trip on the Toyos. And I, yeah. Uh, But youth baseball started. And so now like my world is drastically less free time uh because now i have three boys like if you saw my schedules on tuesday nights people would puke um <laughs> ross is at no like the one from friends at no like yeah i said it right at no, uh no not like the one from no friends. not like the one from friends. damn it i'm trying to figure out something to change it to because i'm sick of typing that shit out every time well i only have to type no and it prompts me and i just tap you you guys are besties <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's a lot of tagging going on. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, we don't cross the streams. Um, and I'm at Overlanding Dad. <laughs> Not to be confused with Overland Dad, but if you want to go follow that guy too, definitely go follow that guy. He's got a 200 series and it's amazing. I don't have a 200 series. Get him on the show. I have a 100 series. That's you true. Do. We didn't even talk about yeah, it. Holy <laughs> shit, we didn't talk about the 100. <laughs> yeah, there it is. It's great. And it's been doing its job, right? Oh, it's been great. It's been great. It's quiet. I mean, if its job is sucking ridiculous quantities of fuel while being very comfortable and reliable, then yes, it's doing its job. How bad is your gas mileage? I'm at like 14. That's what I'm getting. Okay, so. And he weighs more than you, Ross. I know. As in the Land Cruiser weighs more than the Ford. <laughs> I don't actually know David or Ross's uh, weight. <laughs> I probably do way more. <laughs> I don't know. COVID wasn't so friendly. <laughs> Sweet. That's the show. Well, we did it. 